Critterology. I like that. I like that in the scientist. You're gonna have to wear this, okay? No, if I'm gonna wander, I should. Yes. You know, I'll take our seats and those are in the back. We have to get some help getting in here. We need to get started. Continuing in line with Dr. Whitaker's lecture, I'm going to present a very dear friend of mine, a gentleman I've known for 15 years, I guess. If you've known me for 15 years, how can you call me a gentleman? Or a friend. Oh, all right. I'll buy that. I first met uh, Dr. Hoekster back in Detroit when I was director of a pain clinic, and we are going to introduce thermography to the pain clinic. Uh, this was at a hospital in Mount Clemens. And, uh, you know, I'm in my suit and tie, I'm ready to make a presentation. He pulls up in a ski jacket and no tie. I think he has a severe allergy to ties. And I think if I'm ever invited to your funeral, you'll never wear a tie for that either, right? No, no, I'll have to be dead. Philip is a hematologist, <laughs> a physiologist. His mentor was Dr. Lida Madman. Philip taught me dark field microscopy. He teaches dark field courses all over the world. He is the foremost thermographer that I know and taught me thermography. If you ever want to learn what these critters look like under a microscope, learn how to do it yourself, I suggest that you go spend time with him, visit him. He lives in the suburbs of Detroit, Huntington Woods. And say Detroit. He's taught me, he's been one of my mentors in medicine, has taught me more than anybody else about medicine. I can call Philip up with some harebrained idea about maybe a bacteria causing cancer or some type of new antibiotic or natural remedy, thinking I can have something up on him, and I'll say, oh, if you look at so-and-so and so-and-so, that's been done already, or give me the reference. He's way ahead of everybody else. Um, certainly a genius in his own right, and he's gonna talk about the, his title of the, 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 uh, the seven is speech is the basic nature of stealth microorganisms, or his own term, critterology. Dr. Philip Hoekstra, big hand please. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Well, he's giving me something to live up to now, and I, uh, oh, well, <laughs> okay, I'll try to be pretty close to it. We'll become intimately engaged. Uh, Chris has given me something uh, to live up to now, and I hope I don't disappoint you good folk. Um, I'm pleased to speak to a clinical group like this uh, because uh, truthfully you folk are in the trenches, uh, or in the cavities in this case. And, uh, okay. I may have to make it a nasal implant. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm pleased to speak to a clinical group like this uh, because you folk are truly in the trenches um, and unfortunately, there's a lot of things that are very relevant uh, to your practices uh, that are not being covered in your basic education and are only available in a spotty sort of way that you would, ex you would be picking up from postgraduate education. Um, one of the uh, topics uh, that you really need to know about uh, if you uh, are working in, in any capacity in clinical medicine these days, whether it be dentistry or uh, medical practice, uh, is the relationship that we all have with microorganisms. Uh, and it is quite different than what your uh, basic microbiology taught you oh so many years ago. Uh, that was basically the Dr. Seuss version of it all. <coughs> now, um, many of us when we start thinking of microorganisms, we think of it in very special categories, they're very much an us versus them. And we think of it in special uh, cat circumstances, like uh, we're now exposed to some bacteria or virus or fungus, and because we've done so, it has um, uh, an intimate association with a, patho with a pathology. And um, uh, this largely comes from very simplistic thinking. Uh, it's easier to teach simplistic thinking, uh, but the problem is in the real world, it begins to break down very quickly, and it leads to a lot of frustration and confusion and, and bad practice. Uh, all things I, I'd like to be addressing. Now, 
through the, the course of, of this, uh, as Chris will tell you, I'm, I'm one, um, uh, I, I don't suffer from a great deal of politeness. Uh, my mentor, uh, Dr. Mattman, is a very polite woman. Uh, she smiles very sweetly, even if, if the most phenomenal male bovine fecal excrement is in the air around her. And it, un <coughs> unless somebody is specifically asking her a question, uh, she'll, she'll not address it at all. Um, now, this type of thing doesn't make me uh, the friend of everybody, uh, particularly those who have uh, 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 what I would refer to as isms to push. Uh, the isms are uh, things that take on the, the cult of a personality uh, or the cult of some particular line of thought. Uh, the line of thought should be truth and the, uh, the thinking should be, some, uh, should be originating from you. It should be that the things that we're covering here and the things that you're picking up from your clinical practice have to make rational sense to you. And I'm hoping to give you a perspective uh, that is different. Now, uh, Chris has seen to it that I've got enough time in all this to where, uh, unlike uh, Dr. Whitaker covering a specific to topic of um, the uh, Lyme's disease, uh, I can do something of a review class with this. And uh, if you'll, some of this may be remedial for you, but uh, uh, there may be others among you uh, for whom this is something very necessary. For, so if I'm getting into remedial things, perhaps you'll be patient with me. Uh, maybe it's going somewhere where you have not visited before, and you might find it interesting or important, hopefully both. <coughs> um, the name of the talk, uh, The Pervasive Nature of Stealth Microorganisms, I thought was a pretty good one. <coughs> but we're going to be building towards that type of thing. And uh, we're going to be covering a great deal of topics in terms of medical microbiology. Um, I, I tend to, in the practice that I have where I have a, a laboratory that uh, is examining patients' blood and the studies that I do, I, I tend to become a little less formal and refer to this as, as critterology. And that's largely because that's how I see it. Um, there's uh, a very important concept uh, that uh, uh, I have acquired over the years and if, uh, I'd like to pass that one on to you and that's the concept of dysgenesis. And this was a coined term I invented all myself. Uh, you have uh, free rights to use it if you like or flush it away if you don't. Uh, the, the idea of this, the dysgenesis is in contrast to the uh, uh, notion of distinct pathology. Uh, pathology is something that is uh, very well defined by our friends in allopathic medicine and its, uh, its parameters and characteristics are something that are, are well defined and very uh, rigid. Um, as an example that I use in hematology, uh, you are not officially anemic uh, or not showing an official uh, sign of anemia uh, by abnormally small red blood cells, the microcytes, unless you have 25% microcytes. And most labs won't even report 24.5% uh, because it's not a distinct disease state. They're defining pathology as 25%, uh, and that's the, a very sharp division. And that means because you have now 25% microcytes, they can do all kinds of things to you. They can give you dangerous drugs. They could potentially put you in the hospital, give you transfusions. Uh, and oh well, if you died, you had a pathology anyway. Uh, you, you're, you're not that much worse off. But I can tell you that a great number of people <laughs> don't feel much worse uh, or uh, much better at 24.5% than they do at 25. And, uh, in my lab, I will report abnormally small red blood cells down to a very small proportion, it's a very small percentage, not because I'm trying to redefine what pathology is, uh, but because I'm trying to give a, a, a practitioner with a more holistic perspective uh, a greater piece of information. Now, in that concept, uh, using that one as sort of out of this concept, or out of the notion of critterology, um, in the notion of dysgenesis, uh, we have a distinct disease state that is characterized by all the features of pathology, just like the 25% uh, microcytes. Um, but we have, to inter we have to introduce a new concept into that, and that's health. And health does exist as a distinct state as well, or at least an idealized state. And that's when everything is functioning uh, well and in harmony. All of our organ systems are, are functioning optimally, and they're functioning har in harmony, which means they're interacting well. And when we move out one step, it also refers to the emotional and spiritual well-being of that individual as an entity. 
And until we incorporate all of those things in, in their uh, f uh, functioning in a swimming kind of way, we don't really have health. Now obviously then pathology and health exist uh, as distinct states. But what about the space between them? Now unless the distinct pathology that we're talking about uh, is being hit by a truck, uh, we're, we then define a gray zone that exists between these. You don't immediately move from one to the other unless you're being hit by a truck or uh, some other means of trauma. And it's this gray zone that I refer to as dysgenesis, which is a term for things falling apart, instead of genesis, where things are coming together. So this is a concept that helps me to understand things a little better, because I know that people don't become, for instance, iron deficient anemic or develop some severe infectious type of disease out of the blue. It came from somewhere. It has roots. Now, another very important concept uh, is that uh, this dysgenesis, the things that go together to make up a pathology, are always multifactorial. And the, the longer I work clinically, the more apparent this is to me. Now, um, it may well be that uh, in common medicine, it's very easy to link uh, a particular organism to a particular disease state. And this is the kind of very simplistic thinking that uh, is taught in microbiology 103 and uh, it's the kind of thing that uh, uh, would probably get you past your national boards. Uh, but it's not the way the real world works. Uh, uh, disease states are multifactorial. And you can look at many different disease states and you begin to separate out what are what I consider the roots of dysgenesis, that these things come from many different levels. Um, one of the levels, to be sure, is, is genetic. Uh, by virtue of our being human beings, we tend not to be susceptible to tobacco mosaic virus. Okay, if you're a tobacco plant, you've got a real problem with that. As a human, as a human, or as a, if we were tobacco plants, uh, we may not be subject to uh, any any number of common ailments that take place clinically. Okay, so there's relative advantages in one species over another. And plants, for instance, are not often subject to the same type of uh, infectious diseases or degenerate states. Uh, that animals are. And um, uh, while we're uh, still working out the connection uh, with uh, uh, things like hoof and mouth disease in, in um, Europe these days, uh, it may well be that, uh, that human beings are in fact protected from this just by our species definition. In this case, it's uh, better to be human than to be a cow. Uh, but one of the axioms that goes along with this uh, is that the more, gen more complex the genetic material, uh, the more likely there is to be some type of a hole there, uh, a hole that may uh, provide uh, for a susceptibility. Uh, and this can be seen in many different types of ways. We know that, for instance, uh, uh, there are uh, certain gene combinations that make us more susceptible to rheumatoid arthritis. And we know that there are oncogenes that would make us much more susceptible to cancers of certain types, and it can often be pretty specific. And uh, there are gene uh, tendencies that make us more susceptible to type 2 diabetes. Now, having any of these oncogenes or any of these uh, particular flaws uh, does, not, uh, does not predestine us for this disease. And we know that there's more taking place than this. Now, one of the great selling features that was used is uh, uh, we've all been kicking in large amounts of money for the Human Genome Project, is that this would be the uh, panacea for all disease states. And by understanding the human genome, uh, now uh, we could uh, uh, fix the various holes and uh, see to it that uh, all the brown-eyed people had that genetic flaw corrected, and, um, you know, we, we could take this quite far. Um, but uh, these genes re only represent a potential. Now, the genetic material is uh, a lot like uh, the, the material on my, the hard drive of my computer. It has the, the bug that shows up now and then, uh, but I, and I certainly don't use it all. Uh, but it doesn't determine exactly what it is I'm going to be doing with my computer. And that's going to involve a great deal more interaction with the environment, and from the computer's perspective, that's me. Now, another very important root of this genesis, uh, from my perspective anyway, is stress. Now, stress... Uh, uh, to use the good uh, uh, Salier concept, it has to be thought of really in the broadest sense. And in many cases, uh, we're dealing with stresses as a species that we never have before. Now, um, 
certainly from my perspective, this is where microorganisms fit uh, as a stressor. They can be specific and we, they can find particular flaws uh, in us that uh, uh, create a problem, but they do not themselves define a problem. Stress is also coming from many other directions. Uh, and it's kind of curious that, some, that these will have a, um, a, a, a dysgenic, a, a dysfunctional perspective or effect on, um, uh, on us as an entity. Um, as a species, we've never had to deal with traffic jams uh, like we do now. We've never had to deal with uh, um, the kinds of time constraints that we have to get things done. Uh, and these are all different types of stressors. We never had to deal with as much ultraviolet light as a species as we do now. Um, there are a great number of things that we are dealing with that we've never had to deal with before uh, that we don't have adapted mechanisms for. Um, though it's a bit off the topic in terms of, of stressors, uh, the types that we don't have a, a long um, experience with as a species well, uh, the types of, ex uh, of stresses that we do have a long-term experience with are things like being cold, being hungry, um, having something chase us, ready to eat us. Uh, those are experiences as a species that we've had for a long time, and we have mechanisms for this. When we're cold, we, uh, we have ways of, of covering our hide and getting uh, some heat going, okay? But um, being stuck in a traffic jam or having some type of a deadline, uh, especially as these things become more uh, arbitrary, um, uh, we really don't have uh, adaptive mechanisms to deal with. And these are stressors. And there was a, a great story of uh, in the German army during the First World War, uh, the German Medical Corps reviewed uh, the uh, existence of what they called stress-related diseases. And they found that they were uh, disproportionate in the people who were in the uh, back lines. They were in the quartermaster corps and the, the training people, not the ones who were uh, up in the front lines uh, in the mud and the blood and, and with the, uh, the bullets and the shrapnel. Uh, so what they did many times is to take these people who had what they were defining as stress-related diseases and they gave them their helmet and their rifle and with their bayonet fi they're fixed and they sent them up to the front line. And they gave them the kind of stressors that we as a species have been dealing with for a long time. They could see just where their problem was coming from. Uh, and that uh, actually, the, their stress-related diseases were self-resolved at that point. Um, <coughs> <laughs> now, another, another factor that you have to look at for dysgenesis as well uh, comes from the, the element of nutrition. Because there's a great deal that can be done uh, to offset the effects of stress uh, and to offset the effects of uh, genetics uh, by uh, nutrition. Nutrition is providing us with the fuel that we need to operate as an entity, so, sort of our uh, corporeal gasoline. Uh, it also provides us with catalytic materials in terms of things like our vitamins. Uh, and it also uh, is providing uh, the building blocks uh, to repair and uh, uh, extend ourselves, uh, sometimes laterally as we get a little older. Um, and when you put these types of things together, uh, the notion of uh, genetic and uh, stresses and uh, nutrition, uh, you can begin to see diseases occurring, especially the degenerate diseases. You can look, for instance, at type 2 diabetes, and you know that there's a genetic predisposition for that type of thing, but you also know that people who uh, have that predisposition are, are not necessarily going to develop it. Uh, however, uh, if you uh, put that person under various types of stresses uh, and you affect uh, them uh, nutritionally, if their uh, source of, uh, their major source of caloric intake, let's just say they're a policeman and uh, therefore they're uh, duty bound to oblige in donuts, uh, they're consuming large numbers of, of uh, sugar donuts while at the same time um, uh, they're meeting uh, arbitrary deadlines and occasionally getting shot at. Um, these types of things are much more likely to uh, manifest themselves in somebody developing type 2 diabetes. And truly, when you begin to look, if, if you had the omniscience uh, of being able to look at genetic flaws, and this is what is many uh, done uh, by uh, a lengthy interview in homeopathy where you, ex you look into the miasms, these, these types of in innate uh, flaws that a person has, and you begin to see the types of stresses they have taking place in their life, 
Um, and you begin to look over their uh, nutritional history, not uh, just in the th last two months since they found religion, uh, but really back over uh, a long period of time, these degenerating diseases become perfectly predictable. And uh, uh, it doesn't take a great deal of omniscience to be able to, to see these things. It just uh, becomes uh, just basic common sense. Another good example um, uh, of uh, types of uh, circumstances uh, where these things interact uh, that are uh, perhaps a little more, well, were germane a long time ago. Uh, when the Black Plague swept through Europe, killing off oh so many people, uh, there were individuals and sometimes pretty good numbers of them who were able to work among uh, the infected. Uh, they too were bitten by the fleas and uh, uh, certainly exposed to the organism, but guess what? They never developed the Black Plague at all. Um, and they may have been uh, put through the same types of stresses uh, as the individuals uh, who did succumb to the disease were. Um, and they um, uh, may have been had the same type of nutritional material to work with, but they may have had some type of genetic difference. There was something different about them. Uh, nature does this type of thing to improve the genetic lot now and then. Um, now, an, another factor that we can see uh, many times has to do with cancer specifically. And uh, I am going to be uh, moving from the field of uh, distinct critterology to its, its relevance into cancer. Uh, because there's a lot of material coming down in that type of thing. It's not a radical concept anymore uh, that many organisms that are, uh, uh, don't have to be uh, uh, terribly obscure or, ter or highly specialized have an important role in, the, in oncogenesis. Uh, but in cancer, uh, I, I do a lot of work uh, with breast cancer in women, and uh, I see uh, families where uh, breast cancer is, is something exceptionally common. And we may discover that uh, through genetic testing that these women may have the BRCA1 or the BRCA2 gene. But you can clearly see the differences in them depending on some of the circumstances of, of their life that, that uh, basically define different stressor situations um, um, and how they've taken care of themselves in terms of nutrition. Uh, antioxidants are awfully important in this regard. Uh, this does not have to predestine, the, the presence of the oncogene is not going to predestine them for the disease. Now, this becomes especially intriguing when we're dealing with things that are just so awful uh, as uh, AIDS. Uh, AIDS, uh, uh, we've come to a, uh, as, as a, somebody I know says, a, a premature consensus. Uh, this is a, a Dr. Ruth Bernstein, who's a professor at Michigan State. And uh, he's uh, written a book that um, uh, looks at the circumstances and says that we've come to a premature consensus that uh, HIV causes AIDS. And the, the popular thinking is, of course, well, this is very linear. If, we, if a person is infected with HIV, it's only a matter of time uh, and circumstances until they uh, develop AIDS. Uh, the reality of it is much different because we see that the, at least 10% of those people uh, who are infected long-term uh, with HIV do not go on to develop AIDS at all. Uh, now we can begin to ask ourselves, what is different about this type of person? And it may well be in genetic or uh, the stressor circumstances or nutritional status, but the point is that when we look at something uh, that, that is uh, so serious and uh, if you've dealt with AIDS patients uh, so hopeless appearing many times as AIDS, when you look at diseases as being multifactorial, you see that they, uh, uh, they depend on a number of different factors. And if you pull out th some of those factors that you can handle, you may not have a way of addressing HIV, but if there are other cofactors that are essential to this that you can address, uh, what you've done is basically break the disease cycle. You have um, prevented that disease. And this is exactly what we've seen in so many of these circumstances. So, uh, this notion of dysgenesis is, is one that's occurred to me mainly from uh, my clinical experience, and the more I've, I've worked clinically, the more uh, correct I see this being. And uh, while I've listed three things, that certainly doesn't mean this is necessarily the best way of, of looking at it. Uh, this, is one, this is how it's occurred to me, uh, and it certainly doesn't mean this is, uh, these are the only factors to look at. I'm sure that uh, uh, there are uh, more specific ways of addressing this. 
Now, particularly with this talk, uh, I, I want to get around to talking about microorganisms as stressors. Uh, and that's truly what their role is. They do not define disease states. Now, uh, back when, when microorganisms were first uh, being discovered, uh, they were being discovered in the context of a disease state and this kind of very linear thinking of uh, a particular type of organism to a particular disease state was uh, the result of uh, uh, just a, a, an empirical type of wisdom. And this is largely where the germ theory came from and this is uh, what made the reputation for Pasteur. Uh, but you know Pasteur had his detractors. Uh, there were other people at the time who were saying that, uh, well, th these organisms really were very incidental. Uh, they really didn't have anything to do with it at all. That the most important thing was um, what was referred to as the, the, the terrain, uh, how, uh, what sort of condition that uh, person was in. And it was really that particular condition, just how uh, specifically uh, they had uh, certainly generating conditions that uh, uh, determined whether they were going to develop this disease or not. So these were the competing schools of thought, and uh, pa Pasteur largely won out because it was a simpler way to approach things. Uh, but the truth is that uh, both of these things have to be considered. It's not so simple as looking at a, uh, uh, a particular kind of, of microorganism and lining that person up with a particular type of disease. Uh, one of the things you don't hear about uh, these days are the things that really make things messy. Um, it was only a few years ago that Science Magazine had on opposite pages um, one article entitled HIV Causes AIDS and another page opposite that saying HIV does not cause AIDS. Now, uh, this is not part of the kind of thinking that gets down to the level of the practitioner. For them, it's kept very simple, you know, basically coloring books and crayon type level. And they think, well, you know, we won't trouble their pretty heads about these types of things. But the truth is that the practitioners are the people who are in the trenches, and they need to know the, the arguments that are taking place and the issues. And uh, that's not the type of thing that you're largely going to be picking up from postgraduate education. And that's certainly not what you're going to pick up uh, uh, in your professional education, where the, they need to keep it as simple and concise as at all possible. Now, um, this, is, this mixed model, as I'll call it, combining some of the work of uh, uh, Pasteur and those uh, who talked about the terrain, um, presents a more messy model. And it, it basically talks about the infectivity of a microorganism on one hand uh, versus the, the barrier or the uh, chemical defenses on the other. Now, the truth is that there are many, many types of microorganisms that would love to use us as growth media. And by virtue of uh, all the good stuff that we've got, I mean, uh, uh, they would see us as ripe for the pickings. Um, howsoever, uh, well, in that context, we have a, a first level of defense against them from something as basic as skin and our chemical defenses. Um, the person with the most powerful immune system going, no matter how sterling it was, if you were to peel that person out of their skin, uh, if you were to denude the, epithe the uh, mucosal layer of their gut, um, uh, if you were to break down some of the chemical defenses in their gastrointestinal system, there is no way that the uh, person is not going to become basically culture media for the various critters that are out there looking to make a living off of us. So these, uh, the skin and the chemical defenses, which come from things like the uh, acidic nature of our uh, uh, stomach acids and the alkaline nature of our bile and the lysozyme that's in uh, tears and, uh, so and um, uh, uh, digestive enzymes, all these things are acting uh, uh, at, at a very important level. And when these things begin to break down, the second level of defense is the immune system. Um, now, there's another thought that I want to interpose to this that's not quite so easy, and that is that the, something that's even more important, perhaps, than um, the uh, barriers and the chemicals is our, our discretion that we learn. Uh, we learn, basically, not to wade in the sewer. Uh, we learn to avoid uh, rancid food. Uh, uh, 
uh, we uh, avoid things that obviously are uh, heavily tainted with microorganisms uh, for, the chem for the changes that they manifest that way. Now, uh, another aspect uh, of looking at this is the concept of the pathogenicity or the, pa the disease producing potential of a microorganism uh, versus the host innate immunity and the um, uh, integrity of the cells. Now, there's a very important concept here. Uh, we may look at certain microorganisms. You can look, for instance, at the, um, uh, some types of um, uh, the typh some strains of uh, the typhus bacteria uh, uh, as being potentially uh, lethal in a matter of hours. Um, there are uh, some uh, bacteria around that are as close to Darth Vader as you can imagine. Uh, same type of thing for viruses. When we start talking about HIV, this is a dark and sinister thing. Um, but um, uh, in many cases, the integrity of the host immunity is going to define this very closely. Now, here's a concept. Uh, only about 4% of those hospital workers uh, who have needle sticks uh, from uh, HIV-infected uh, needles uh, actually become HIV positive. Okay, if HIV is all that infectious, how come this is 4%? How come it isn't much higher than that? And the, herein, uh, you have to have a critical number of microorganisms to, uh, el to um, uh, establish a disease, uh, much like you have to have a certain number of microorganisms uh, to be able to get a positive culture response, something called a colony-forming unit. Um, <coughs> And um, the better your innate uh, immunity is working, the less likely you are to uh, 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 be infected by a, a unit dose of these microorganisms. Now, if this hospital worker um, uh, uh, is somebody who's been, at it, who's been heavily stressed in, in many different ways, whose immune system is not functioning well uh, because of bad nutrition, um, they more likely to be among that 4% uh, who uh, now seroconvert and are HIV positive as a result of a needle stick. Now, the innate uh, host immunity uh, is also relative to the integrity of the tissue, uh, which goes back to the uh, condition of the nutrition, how well we're meeting some of those nutritional needs. A great example here, I sat through a lecture so many years ago by a virologist, and the virologist was talking about the relationship between human papillo papillomavirus and cervical cancer and that it, this has been something that's been studied very extensively. There are many, many different strains of human papillomavirus, each of which has a particular uh, pathogenic potential. They can tell you that uh, if you've got this particular strain, you, there's this and this percentage of developing uh, cervical cancer over such a length of time. Uh, and particularly uh, when you start combining uh, the, the, these various different uh, strains of the virus, uh, it can uh, truly make a, a very uh, high potential. But uh, the one example that the, this virologist cited, uh, almost as an aside, uh, is something that drew a lot of my attention. And that is this virologist said, well, really, no matter how bad a combination uh, of these viruses may be going on, if the cervical tissue is healthy and well glycosylated, it seems to be able to, p to resist the viruses altogether. So much for the germ model in, in human papillomavirus in, in cancer. It's not that simple an equation. Now, um, the title of this talk re uh, relative to the stealth microorganisms is something very important uh, because uh, we're looking at many different disease states uh, that, re that uh, are not obviously uh, linked or have not been traditionally linked with microorganisms. Uh, many of these are, are not so e uh, easily identified as a typhoid in, uh, infection uh, and the disease that it produces. But the kinds of, of problems that plague uh, humanity these days are largely from degenerating diseases. And the hand of microorganisms as a, an important stressor in these really can't, uh, it is something that's been uh, not appreciated. And therein, um, I've had the advantage of working with uh, people like Dr. Matman, uh, whose um, uh, influence on me has been, been very strong. So, uh, I, uh, if uh, um, 
if I if I take some digressions here uh, uh, from traditional thinking, you'll you'll be able get an idea as to where that came from. Um, uh, Dr. Mattman has been very interested uh, as an academic in working in clinical models for a long time. This largely came from uh, the influence of her late husband. Uh, her late husband was one of the founders of a small hospital in Detroit and uh, basically gave her free run of uh, uh, the lab in many cases. And one of the things that she did was to take the negative blood cultures from uh, the various patients that were there. Um, again for various reasons and she subjected them to a, a better uh, type of culturing technique uh, and was able to grow critters in every instance. Now <coughs> I've used the term critters here rather than uh, talking about some particular uh, genus and species of bacteria um, uh, largely because it's, it's been my experience over time uh, that we are a walking zoo. Uh, that uh, not only do we all harbor uh, various types of organisms, but we harbor a whole collection of them. And we have an ongoing challenge from them uh, that we deal with uh, every minute of every day, uh, 365 and a quarter days a year. And that in many cases, uh, these organisms as being stressors uh, are, are the uh, roots of, the, are, uh, of destruction then are already in us. And it's a matter as to uh, not necessarily the exposure of these, but how well we deal with these things. It determines uh, what is going to be our fate. Um, it's easy enough to talk about things like having candida albicans or various different types of staph or strep, strep in the skin. And as dentists, you know that the, the mouth is a, a veritable garbage pit. Uh, it's probably the filthiest spot uh, of the whole anatomy. Um, uh, we, we think of these in terms of being somehow still outside of us, even if it's in the, the mouth, we think of the barriers uh, as necessarily preventing uh, them from sort of reaching our, our inner uh, recesses. But the truth is the microorganisms have a different uh, agenda, and uh, they're far more clever and adapted to dealing with us uh, as good parasites uh, than what we may be giving, giving them credit for. Uh, the microorganisms that you may have studied uh, back in your classes uh, were largely confined to the native classic wild types. And these were, if it was a, uh, a Staphylococcus, it had to be something round. And if it was a, um, uh, an E. coli, it had to be uh, a coccus as well. If it, had, if it was a uh, Bacillus anthrax, it had to be uh, an elongated form. Largely, this comes from our traditional method of mi uh, microbiology, which was studying things with microscopes and learning how things appeared. And we developed a, a lot of axioms uh, regarding microorganisms based on how things uh, or, uh, appeared on the microscope that just uh, do not fully characterize them. Uh, it's not part of the agenda. And very important to that concept is the notion of cell wall deficient forms. Now, this is something that uh, many microbiologists uh, know a, a little about, uh, usually painfully little. Uh, they may think of them as uh, some of the bio their other names, the L forms and the PPLOs, the plural pneumonia-like organisms. Uh, but it's kind of an X-Files uh, in microbiology. <coughs> and many times the microbiologists themselves um, don't consider this type of thing too seriously. They think that these are sort of laboratory curiosities. They don't have a lot of relevance in the real world. And to that I say, au contraire. Uh, these types of things are incredibly important. And until you can begin to appreciate this, uh, you, may, you basically have been ignoring a, a very large chunk of, of uh, clinical microbiology. Now, um, uh, I've, uh, in, in working with Dr. Mattman, I've learned to appreciate the important role of cell wall deficient organisms. Uh, basically, through her access to uh, uh, patients with various different types of diseases, uh, what she's found is that, any, uh, that the cell wall deficient version of a, of a bacteria, for instance, can be found any time that there is a significant infection taking place. Now, uh, what I'd like to do is give you a bit of a primer on what a cell wall deficient form is and why it's different. And uh, as you've seen in the schedule, my, my talk is broken up into three parts. 
Uh, I'm going to take this sequentially uh, from the primer um, to uh, talking about some of the different disease states that are intimately linked with these uh, cell wall deficient organisms. Um, and um, uh, somewhere or another wrap all this stuff up in, in a way that um, uh, may give you a different perspective onto things. Um, Chris, could I ask you to turn on the uh, overhead? I, I've got just a, a simple um, sheet to start things off in this regard. <coughs> um, the bacteria have uh, a different type of structure than do animal cells. Uh, their structure is more like a plant cell in many ways because they have something called a cell wall. Uh, the cell wall is not something found in any type of animal cell at all. And the cell wall uh, is a peptidoglycan, uh, which means it's a combination of uh, uh, carbohydrates and protein. It's a rigid exoskeleton for that organism. And it provides it a physical definition and if it's a uh, E. coli we're talking about, it makes it round. Uh, and if it's a bacillus something or another that we're talking about, it makes it uh, e elongated. And this is the classic native wild type that we're used to studying. However, for various reasons, what, really dark there, for various reasons, I hope you're sitting next to somebody friendly, uh, these organisms and every type of bacteria can do this type of thing they can shed that, that defining cell wall and they become then cell wall deficient. Now, one of the reasons they may do this, bless you, is spontaneously, they may do that just as a variance uh, in an altered state of being, in other words, doing it just for the hell of it, <coughs> or it may happen uh, very rapidly because of antibiotics. Uh, and the, uh, the antibiotic that is most likely to produce cell wall deficiency is an antibiotic that targets the development of the cell wall penicillin. Okay? Um, uh, what penicillin does is prevent replication of the components for the cell wall. Uh, but just about any type of antibiotic is creating a stressful situation for that organism, and it will take on an altered state of being and uh, be can become cell wall deficient. This process is called induction as to how it becomes cell wall deficient. It will lose that physically defining cell wall either completely and become something called a protoplast uh, there um, on your left where we have just a membrane around the uh, loop of nucleic acids or, or it may in, uh, lose it incompletely and some be something called a spheroplast. Now, this is not representing a mutation. This is an altered state of being. The cell has decided, for whatever reason, um, to not have the uh, cell wall uh, there in its full uh, measure any longer. But when this has happened, it, the, the organism takes on many different types of properties. Um, one of the things about the uh, cell wall is that it has, many of the much, has much of the antigenic characterization. Uh, so if we're talking about something like uh, a fungus, candida albicans, uh, this may be the very first uh, organism uh, that we were all exposed to as we were being born. Uh, it was there in some level or another uh, in uh, our mother's vagina, and uh, this was the first critter that we were exposed to. And through time, we have developed various levels of uh, immunology against candida albicans. Uh, however, that uh, that immunologic recognition is very much superficial. Now, when I came in here uh, this morning and I saw Chris, uh, I've seen him in a way that I haven't seen him before. Now, maybe uh, since moving west, he's become much more formal uh, than the, the Chris Husser that I knew back in Michigan, where we both would sit around and have tie-hating sessions. <coughs> but, <coughs> I mean, he's about as sharp a as I've ever seen him these days. And, uh, you know, any better, we'd have to bury him like this. All right, but my recognition of Chris Husser uh, came largely uh, from, the, from the outside, at least initially. Uh, he's, he's about so tall, and he's a built like this, and, you know, he's got a, a, a perpetual mustache, and he's, he's got his glasses like so, and, you know, this is the Chris Husser that I know and love. And that's how I was able to recognize him. And uh, 
if I'm the immune system, this is how I recognize microorganisms as well, from things from the, the outside. I don't recognize things by their nucleic acids, which is truly the, the heart, uh, the, the defining feature of what a microorganism is. Now, God forbid that I had uh, uh, Chris's spleen on a plate, and next to it I had uh, uh, my old friend Gary's spleen. God forbid your, your spleen uh, ever gets on a plate. <coughs> now, I know both of these people to some degree, but I don't know them that intimately to where I could tell Gary's spleen from Chris's spleen. They're both, you know, pretty indistinguishable to me at that point. The immune system does not often get to recognize and characterize its response against things by what is the truest nature of them, which is their genetic material, their DNA in the case of a, of a bacteria. So when an organism becomes cell wall deficient, it's almost like Chris putting on the tux. You know, it's basically camouflaging its true nature. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, Chris could walk through a, a group of polite people and they would never know his true nature. <laughs> All right, no secrets. <laughs> All right. <laughs> now, when an organism sheds uh, much of its cell wall and retains some of it, it's um, sort of like Chris's face sticking out of the tuxedo. I can still recognize him. But uh, put a bag over his head and on the tuxedo, he's completely unrecognizable. That's the case of a protoplast, where we've got nothing uh, to distinguish it by. So uh, if we're talking about candida albicans now, I'm not picking on Chris any longer, um, the candida albicans that we have known and developed this immune characterization to over, over however many years old we are, uh, basically is, is out the window. There may... Uh, uh, the, the antigenic characterization is, is uh, uh, not there any longer, or at least not to nearly the extent that what it was. Now, there's a price that, a, that an organism pays for this kind of, of camouflage ability, its ability to uh, uh, hide itself uh, like a chameleon. And that is that on that uh, cell wall are much of the enzyme systems that organism would use uh, to be able to metabolize uh, things, uh, to use as food substances. And many bacteria are absolutely amazing in their diversity of things that they can metabolize. Uh, you give these things a carbon source and some type of energy, and there's going to be some type of critter that can make use of that uh, environment. But as a cell wall deficient, much of that ability is gone because those uh, enzymes are, are largely found in the cell wall. Now, in terms of antigenicity, proteins are, of course, the, the most antigenic. Uh, when your, your patients have different types of food sensitivities, uh, it's, it's almost always uh, to the protein character of, of some type of a food. Uh, the, the least antigenic material is lipid. Uh, it's extremely unlikely that somebody is going to have a, uh, a food sensitivity to a, a highly refined lipid. Uh, just uh, it just be, the antigen system doesn't work that way. The, the cell membrane, of course, like all the other membranes, uh, is largely composed of lipid. Okay, <clears throat> And one of the things that Meineke discovered so many years ago is that as an organism adapts a little better to a condition of being cell wall deficient, that lipid layer becomes a little thicker. Now also, that cell wall is providing an exoskeleton uh, that's giving that organism its defining shape and also a protection from dehydration, and uh, we can sometimes walk over these things and not necessarily kill them. Um, <coughs> um, and shed of its cell wall, uh, an organism becomes much more fragile. It can become uh, dried out, uh, and uh, it's more subject to uh, uh, literally being burst uh, from uh, low osmotic pressure. But if that organism has managed to find itself fat, dumb, and happy inside a human environment, guess what? Those aren't issues any longer. Those are things it can basically give up because now it's swimming in a sea of, of all kinds of uh, nutritional material that it can find something that it will like to digest. And uh, as far as it, uh, osmotic pressure bursting it or drying out, that's not an issue. Uh, it, it's, it's found a wonderful spot. So this is a, a favored condition for organisms uh, that have taken on an intimate association with us. Now, 
some types of organisms have uh, actually made this kind of a, a trip and they've done so on a permanent basis. Um, in clinical medicine, we really hate to deal with things uh, like um, uh, the mycoplasmas, and we hate to deal with things like chlamydia and rickettsia because they're real pains to deal with. Uh, and the reason for it is they're very, very hard to identify. Uh, it's really hard to know just how pervasive these things are. Um, and microbiologists generally would rather deal with other kinds of organisms that are much easier to work with than, than these. These are very picky in terms of what their nutritional requirements. Now, every type of bacteria, uh, uh, of which I know, is capable of, in, uh, without a, a mutation, becoming uh, uh, cell wall deficient through this process of induction. And because it's not a mutation, they're capable of changing back also if the environment changes or, again, just for the hell of it. They, they can do so spontaneously and for apparently no reason. Um, when it becomes more favorable for them to become cell wall deficient again, they'll take that on. And usually, as a, or, or they'll be the, the classic native wild type again, they'll take that on. Now, there's something else that many organisms uh, give up when they become cell wall deficient, and that's much of their pathogenicity. Uh, with the exception of Proteus, I don't know of any other uh, type of bacteria <coughs> that uh, becomes more pathogenic as it becomes cell wall deficient. These things grow differently, too. If you're growing uh, cultures of, the, uh, of these organisms from somebody's blood, they tend to grow as subsurface cultures, not the nice little raised uh, 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 white colonies that we're used to seeing. And uh, because they grow more slowly and in an uncharacteristic way, this is the type of thing that gets pitched as the, uh, the typical plate uh, in uh, the clinical labs. Now, some types of organisms as a, as a group have basically taken on this uh, cell wall deficient form uh, as, a, as a new way of being. And these, uh, uh, the one that has um, done this uh, in an uh, all-encompassing way is the mycoplasma. Uh, the mycoplasma is a, organ is a type of bacteria that has no cell wall at all, and it's incapable of generating a cell wall. Now, one of the things we know about mycoplasma is that they are pleomorphic. Uh, that is, they have many different body forms. They're extremely difficult to characterize uh, by how they appear. Now, that same type of thing applies also to any other organism as it becomes cell wall deficient. <coughs> and herein lies a problem. Uh, because the microscope and the physical characterization of how these things appear has been such a, a defining feature of our, our clinical microbiology, um, if as a cell wall deficient, uh, an organism takes on a different shape, it is misidentified many times. Or worse yet, it's assumed to have changed its character. We've seen that type of thing. Um, the, as we've gone through uh, various stages of development uh, in understanding uh, cell wall deficient organisms uh, in relationship to human diseases, people have looked at how, at how pure cultures may change uh, their body structures. You may find now a, a caucus amongst uh, the bacilli and think that there's been some type of a transmutation that's taken place. It hasn't. What defines these organisms is not how they appear. That's been a, a handy clinical tool, or a, a tool used in science as well. But we know that is not the defining feature. The defining feature is the nucleic acids. And unless there's some type of mutation that takes place, uh, what became cell wall deficient as a staph epidermis can, is capable of changing back into a cell wall, or into the classic native wild type, it'll still be staph epidermis. It doesn't come out now as some other uh, genus and species. Just because there's been a, a, a change in the appearance of this does not mean that it has changed its, its true heart and structure. Now, therein lies the problem with uh, uh, what we've seen from uh, some of the isms. And one of the isms uh, has to do with the, um, our friend up in Rock Forest, Quebec, as he talks about the, the somatid and has to, uh, uh, Nasonsism is, is what uh, I'm referring to, and also uh, uh, our friend from Germany, Endelein. Uh, they were looking at changes taking place in some of the superficial characteristics of these organisms, 
um, under different types of circumstances that may have influenced it from uh, changes in the terrain and assuming that there was a fundamental identity shift taking place. There was a transmutation. And this has led to some awfully sloppy microbiology. Um, one of the other characteristics that's become uh, very confusing in this is that as an organism becomes cell wall deficient, it's quite uh, capable of going through pore sizes. It's quite capable of becoming very uh, pervasive. We think of the gut, for instance, as managing to exclude organisms that are, that are about one micrometer and bigger. Uh, <coughs> but as a cell wall deficient, when it no longer has that physically defining cell wall around it, an organism becomes extremely pliable. And a great example for this is if you can imagine the opening of a Coke bottle as being uh, essentially equivalent to uh, uh, a pore size in the gastrointestinal system, and now we have this Coke bottle laying in the bottom of the ocean somewhere with uh, a tasty definition, uh, destination in there, say some piece of fish, and now we have two organisms that are coming competitively to uh, that Coke bottle interested in that tasty piece of fish. One of the organisms that we have is a clam. That clam has uh, the exoskeleton very, very similar to the cell wall of a, micro of a bacteria. And our other organism that's there to compete for this uh, tasty piece of fish is an octopus. And an octopus, if you've ever managed to hold one up, is about as icky and amorphous as you're going to get. <coughs> its most uh, uh, physically defining feature is the beak, which is usually not a big chunk of its, uh, um, uh, of its body. So as these two organisms uh, belly up to the uh, opening of this Coke bottle, uh, the clam basically can't get through. It's it bouncing off the, the glass opening from this, and that tasty fish is something very elusive. But the octopus can sort of ooze its way through that pore, uh, consume the fish, and ooze its way on back, provided it wasn't too much fish, I guess. Um, now, the point is that um, uh, there's not a biologic barrier going that will keep out a cell wall deficient organism because these, uh, as they become very flexible, will go through pore sizes of two tenths of a micrometer. Okay, look at your fil filter sterilized uh, fluids around the office, right? Uh, they, uh, the pore size there is about two tenths of, of a micrometer. And that's uh, now been filter sterilized. Don't you believe it? Yeah, you start culturing those filter sterilized uh, materials and you're going to find that they're often filthy. Okay, uh, one of the projects that uh, Dr. Mattman put some graduate students t through so many years ago was looking at some of these uh, common IV fluids uh, that were filter sterilized or other products that were filter sterilized and you find out just how uh, uh, you may actually be concentrating cell wall deficiency in there. <coughs> okay, now we also think not just of, the, of a barrier system in terms of our gut, but uh, uh, one more important to us than that perhaps is the, the blood-brain barrier. Well, guess what? If an organism can manage to get through two-tenths of a micrometer, the blood-brain barrier does not represent a barrier uh, either. Um, so we have a very pervasive nature. There is basically nowhere in the body that an organism as a cell wall deficient can't go. There's no barrier system that is uh, effective against it. And we've also talked about how the immune system is very much impeded from being able to recognize it and be able to deal with it. Now, uh, <coughs> the immune system certainly can recognize cell wall deficient forms, but it's basically a different type of story. And some of the most effective vaccinations that take place uh, use cell wall deficient forms uh, as a material in the vaccine. Uh, because the antigenic characterization that comes from that is going to be the most specific and the strongest. <coughs> now, a type of... Uh, I'd have to look up a list, to be honest with you. Uh, there's a new one that's being used for typhus uh, that I think falls into that category. Um, now, the organisms that, tend, that have lost large chunks of their cell wall um, and exist now... <coughs> as a, a permanent type of cell wall deficient, as a uh, group, we have the chlamydia and the rickettsia. Now, all these are exceptionally uh, small organisms. Uh, they might be fitting into what's, what's become a, a new character 
of the uh, nanobacteria, uh, the ones that are exceptionally small and highly pervasive, many times this is simply because they are very, very flexible. <coughs> and they can uh, manage to uh, get down to elementary particles, uh, which uh, can be three-tenths of a micrometer in size. That's really small. Um, okay. Now, there's one other uh, concept that I want to work on before we uh, wrap uh, today, and that is that um, uh, I, I want to address the, the issue of this kind of transmutation that is theorized in uh, nasonsism with the somatid and endolinism with uh, things like the protid and the endobion, um, um, as well as dealing with some of the uh, issues from uh, uh, microbiology that has become more obscure, things like uh, the microbiology of uh, progenitor cryptocytes or Saponospora polymorpha, where we tried to uh, characterize a specific and somehow novel type of, of bacteria uh, that was specific to some type of disease state, uh, try to make the situation actually more complicated than what it really is. <coughs> now. There are basic fundamental differences between the classifications of uh, viruses to bacteria to fungi uh, to human cells or to animal cells, we'll call it. Um, and here I'm going back to uh, your microbiology 101, but there's a point I want to make out of it. Um, the bacteria and the viruses are certainly prokaryotes. That is, they do not have a distinct nucleus. They have a, a loop of, of nucleic acids. If it's a, a virus, it is either DNA or it's RNA. It's not both. Uh, if it's RNA, it's a retrovirus. It has to have an enzyme along with it, uh, reverse transcriptase. Um, <coughs> a, uh, a virus that I may use as a model for this would be something like the cytomegalovirus, uh, something that uh, uh, is a uh, significant uh, human problem, something in the neighborhood of uh, uh, Ninety-three percent of the North American population is infected with a cytomegalovirus. Um, uh, many are asymptomatic to it, but it is one of those little uh, things that the immune system has to work on every day in order to deal with and keep in check. Uh, the cytomegalovirus um, has about uh, 300,000 base pairs to it. Now, this is a, a very fundamental level of characterization of the complexity of it. Um, base pairs refers to the uh, uh, combination of nucleic acids of, uh, um, as they're paired into the uh, DNA or the RNA. Uh, the cytomegalovirus, of course, is a, a DNA virus. Um, now, when we're dealing with, uh, well, uh, if we can look at, uh, as a measure of the level of uh, complexity of that organism, of its potential, uh, 300,000 then is a, is a, is a measure. Uh, if we look then at a, a bacteria, we're looking at something that is probably in the order of two or three times, uh, no, no, two or three orders of magnitude more complicated. Now, the notion that some type of virus is capable of changing into a, a bacteria uh, is basically inane. Now, it, it, if you're looking at size differences, you can say, well, it's become really small now, so it's too small to be a bacteria. I put it through my two-tenths of a micrometer pore size, so that's going to keep out all the bacteria. Uh, but uh, it must have changed to a virus. Well, uh, those types of, of very simplistic uh, approaches have been used uh, in trying to make a case for this sort of transmutation, that a virus can become a bacteria. And to this, politely, we say male bovine fecal excrement. It can't happen that way. That's a little bit like saying that my Amiga computer, uh, with its uh, 32 kilobytes uh, of uh, RAM and uh, my half a megabyte hard uh, disk, <coughs> is now uh, able to change itself, if I put it in the closet, uh, into a, uh, a Pentium 4 uh, 1.5 gigahertz uh, with uh, 80 meg uh, hard disk and uh, 512 meg in the RAM. These things do not, things can become simpler. It may well be that viruses had an origin as a more complicated type of cell, uh, but to, uh, it, it's easier to become simpler, but it's much more difficult to become more complicated. Um, 
you, you don't take from 300,000 base pairs and now up into the range of uh, 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 30 million uh, uh, in some type of, of spontaneous jump. Uh, <coughs> this sort of thing is, is just nonsensical. And that uh, there are some features that are used clinically uh, or in simple laboratory methods where uh, an apparent change has been made and you know you conclude that this has taken place is basically bad microbiology. It's very simplistic thinking. Now, uh, when we're talking about uh, bacterial cells changing into a, a, a virus uh, or changing into a, uh, uh, a fungal cell or an animal cell of some type, the notion is even more absurd because there are some profound uh, differences. There's differences in our ribosomes in terms of how these cells go about making proteins. There's differences in the structure uh, in terms of, well, uh, if it was a, uh, a DNA virus, well, where did that RNA come from? Where did this higher level of complexity of the genetic material come from? Now it has a nucleus, you know? Uh, there, there's a, a great deal of uh, fundamental differences between these. There is more in common uh, between uh, uh, our ex-president and a toad uh, than there is uh, between a virus and a bacteria. That, that one flew right over you. I can tell it's the end of the day. <coughs> okay. So these are very fundamental differences. Um, the, the true, what really characterizes these organisms uh, are their nucleic acids. And uh, these nucleic acids allow them for more versatility uh, than what they be, may be manifesting at any particular time. Now, a lot of interesting things take place as an organism becomes cell wall deficient. Uh, not only does it uh, evade much of our recognition from common clinical laboratories, not only does it evade the immune system very much, not only does it pervade us uh, very far, um, <clears throat> but we find that there are emergent properties that take place. Now, the, how I got originally uh, into this uh, was that uh, uh, I was very interested in studying the relationship between microorganisms and cancer. Uh, and the way I was seduced into this type of thing uh, was through the work of Virginia Livingston and group. Uh, uh, she had a sizable clinic in San Diego where she was doing alternative work in cancer. And uh, the intriguing thing was that even using the, the relatively simplistic things that she was in terms of uh, uh, a cleaned up type of diet and uh, some basic and rather non-specific immune stimulation, uh, she was getting a much better response in terms of overall, um, uh, well, well, we'll use the word cures or uh, how about a, a lasting remission uh, in her cancer patients. And many times she was a court of last resort as well. Uh, people who were given up as aspiring compost uh, went off to her clinic in, uh, on Duke Street, and uh, many of them f uh, found new life again. Uh, this type of, of clinical observation gave a credibility to the kinds of things that she was working with. And uh, she had uh, this uh, organism that was almost proprietary. It, it was the progenitor cryptocytes. Um, this microorganism, I mean, uh, if you look at the origin of the name that she developed for this, it couldn't have been much more dark and gloomy. Uh, progenitor ancestral uh, cryptocytes hidden killer. Uh, that's about as nasty as it gets. It could, might as well have been Darth Vader. <coughs> and she had a number of different features by which she characterized this organism. And that was that it was pleomorphic. Uh, it could assume some, uh, several different body forms. You could see those things physically on the microscope. But one of the really interesting things, well, the most intriguing thing, I think, uh, was its ability to produce chorionic gonadotropin, uh, or at least a chorionic gonadotropin-like material. And um, none of the classic native wild-type bacteria that I know of uh, yet can produce chorionic gonadotropin. And uh, this was something very intriguing about it. Um, but. Uh, as we began to do more detailed studies, we developed things like genetic probes and began to look not just at some of the superficial features of this organism, like how it appeared and uh, what kinds of things that it liked in culture. Now, one of the th when you were in your microbiology lab classes, you were given your unknowns and you had to look at it and see if it was round or bacillus uh, or some type of spirochete and you 
dutifully wrote that into your lab manual, and that was, again, one of the things that was going to help you to characterize it. And you put it into galactose and mannose and arabnose, and you uh, tested it for acid and gas production, and uh, you tested it for motility, and you wrote positive, negative for all these types of things. And then basically you went to your DIFCO manual, and you looked at the positives and negatives and all of this, and you said, ha, Eureka, I now have Bacillus subtilis. Okay, and uh, you got a good grade on that, and you thought that's how things worked. Um, when uh, organisms have, cell, have the option of becoming cell wall deficient, uh, they could cause you to flunk that course every time. <laughs> <coughs> because uh, they don't do things necessarily as, uh, as prescribed, uh, as they're expected, as the DIFCO manual tells them to. And as I pointed out here, uh, as an organism becomes cell wall deficient, well, basically its body morphology is not that important any longer as to whether it's uh, a coccus or a bacillus or, or something else. Um, and it can take on different types of metabolic characteristics. It, um, maybe in its classic native wild type, it could uh, metabolize arabnose but not galactose. Uh, but now, as a cell wall deficient, it can't work in either one of them. It's got to have something uh, quite different. One of the characteristics that was discovered uh, uh, was that uh, this organism, or at least this progenitor cryptocytes that was being studied, um, as we began to look at it with genetic probes and getting down to its essence of essence, its genetic material, um, uh, it, it was not one genus and species of organisms. It was a collection of different types of relatively uh, mundane organisms. It was various different types of staph and strep. But these all had something in common now, and that is that they had taken on, they had become cell wall deficient and had taken on uh, some different properties. And one of the properties as a cell wall deficient that they had that they did not have as a classic native wild type was the production of chorionic gonadotropin-like material. Now this is really very interesting uh, because the type of critters that uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Livingston was working with were necessarily linked with uh, cancer. And you'd be hard, one of the, the hottest areas of cancer research these days has to do with angiogenesis, the development of new blood vessels to provide uh, nutrition for solid tumors in the body. Well, you'd be hard put to find a better uh, angiogenic material than chorionic gonadotropin. So it may well be that this organism, or at least this, this property of organisms as a cell wall deficient, common ordinary organisms, was something that was very important to oncogenesis, to the development of a successful tumor. Now, uh, an, uh, one of the disillusioning features here was to find that these were ordinary types of microorganisms. These were the staph and strep that we had uh, we, we thought that we knew really well, and there couldn't be anything too weird and sexy in any of them because uh, we knew Staph epidermis really well, and we knew sta uh, Staph aureus and uh, our various different strep critters. We knew those things very well, and we sort of dismissed them as, oh, well, uh, pretty mundane, uh, not capable of uh, uh, any new wrinkles. But the truth is that these organisms that are very familiar uh, have quite a bag of tricks. These are organisms that have adapted themselves to human beings uh, over untold generations exceptionally well. <coughs> and uh, in doing so, uh, they have, the, uh, uh, have taken on the, the ability to become really good parasites uh, <coughs> to uh, uh, in infect us and uh, not themselves evoke much of a response. Uh, in their cell wall deficient form. And the concept that I want to close with today is uh, what this talk is all about and where we're going uh, with this in the next four hours that I've got uh, as I talk more about specific instances of certain types of microorganisms being uh, linked with uh, uh, some disease states that uh, uh, are not obviously being thought of as, as uh, with a, a microbiological root. Um, where we're going with this is in the terms of the stealth microorganisms, the stealth bacteria and the stealth viruses, because there's a lot of exciting things that happen clinically in that regard. Um, for references on the stealth viruses, if you have any interest in some of the neurologic disorders that seem uh, 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 very perplexing, anything from 
uh, schizophrenia to uh, autism, uh, you uh, really need to look at some of the work of uh, Dr. John Martin. Uh, he's doing some fabulous things uh, in terms of uh, a stealth uh, virus. Uh, what he's, um, we'll talk more about that in the uh, uh, hours to come. Uh, when uh, my mentor in microbiology, uh, Dr. Matman, was looking for a subtitle uh, for the second edition of her book, uh, she was looking for something that would <coughs> more directly address uh, or bring an interest to the whole concept. Uh, the title of her first book, uh, Cell Wall Deficient Forms, great book, uh, uh, but it, it didn't, uh, there's nothing in the title that particularly leaped off and began to explain the whole concept. Uh, so together we put our, our heads and we came up with a note with the subtitle, uh, Stealth Pathogens. Um, and uh, the, the stealth is a very important concept in this, and it now has a, an official definition. Uh, I didn't know it at the time that Dr. Matman and I thought this up, uh, but uh, the stealth has, has caught on as a, uh, a term in microbiology now. And as we're beginning to revisit the area of bacteriology, uh, in the, particularly in, the, uh, in relation to uh, the autoimmune diseases, uh, we're finding the stealth concept to be very important. The, the definition of the stealth is infection without inflammation and being able to evade much of the uh, host's immune system. <coughs> so with that, uh, I'd like to leave that as a teaser as to where we're going with the next four hours. So or, uh, uh, I, I have a few of you at least showing up to listen to some of this stuff uh, because it will. I promise it'll become uh, more... Uh, specific and more clinical, um, and hopefully I can uh, find something in there, whether it be Crohn's disease or multiple sclerosis or rheumatoid arthritis, or uh, we can also deal with the heady area of cancer itself. Um, uh, you, I think you might be amazed at the progress that's already been made in these areas uh, in terms of scientific medicine, and I'm hoping that um, uh, by seeding uh, the uh, clinical people such as yourself, we can make a difference in terms of patient care. Have, uh, I, I'm going to have slides. Yep. Like yep. I'm, I'm going to have things that uh, will, will upset your lunch. <laughs> <coughs> Thank you. <coughs> um, Oh, come on. Please. Did you, did you do a blood level on somebody with a gonadotropin releasing factor and that had no other <coughs> Well, as a matter of fact, one of the tests that uh, uh, was being done uh, by many of the people who were uh, Dr. Livingston's devotees was to send a blood specimen off for a pregnancy test. And a uh, common pregnancy test uh, was often coming back with readings of chorionic gonadotropin. And but often what you had to do was to um, do a little bit of camouflaging of the patient's identity because the people in the lab would uh, go back and sort of revisit the results if they found out that their patient was a 56-year-old male. They, they don't like to, uh, come up, coming up with an indication of pregnancy in such people. It's one for the journals. Well, yeah, there anything is possible. Please, sir. Are the common oral water filters that are being used uh, permeable to the cell wall? Um, well, in many cases, the, the, uh, the, me the, the membranes used uh, really only allow one molecule of water through at a time. Uh, so they're of a much finer pore size than uh, two tenths of a micrometer. And they're uh, by vert. Uh, by this, uh, by virtue of their being able to filter out uh, things like uh, um, uh, some uh, common electrolytes, they're able to take out salt that way, and uh, uh, that would certainly exclude uh, something as big as, as uh, either a, a cell wall deficient bacteria or a virus. But uh, the answer is yes. <laughs> Please, Gary.
Yes. But they grow different, that's why they cannot be picked up in most of the cases in regular labs. Well, Do you have an idea how much slower and uh, just well, day wise? Well, that, that is something very dependent on the medium. Uh, I don't mean uh, the folks who bring us television and radio. Um, when um, uh, Dr. Mappin and I began to uh, work on a, uh, a cell bacteria, uh, one that uh, we uh, uh, have associated with uh, multiple sclerosis. Uh, initially, when we were uh, largely working in the dark, it took about uh, nine months uh, of culturing to be able to get a recognizable culture, uh, recognizable growth take place, a, a colony. And uh, uh, Dr. Matman is an exceptionally patient woman, and I've, I've depended on that many times personally. Uh, and as I, I tell you my tale of woe uh, regarding uh, some of the work I did with uh, Candida albicans, uh, uh, I've depended on her patience. Uh, she says that working with cell wall deficient organisms is uh, uh, something that should largely be left to women because of their greater level of patience. <coughs> but uh, as uh, you're getting to your point, uh, or getting to the point, of what you're asking, uh, as we've improved the media, uh, as we have learned now to that uh, uh, this organism that we find in, in multiple sclerosis patients likes, uh, for instance, a slightly uh, uh, more acid environment, and it, it likes uh, uh, it's microaerophilic. We can we can modify the the growth conditions. Uh, we can get growth much more rapidly. And uh, now I believe that she gets uh, routine growth of uh, this organism in, um, in, in a broth culture in just a few days. I mean, to where it is, it, it's, it's really taken off. I'm, I'm, it, it's a broth culture. Um, uh, Dr. Matman tends to like, and especially, uh, I, I would say more broadly than that, many cell wall deficient organisms tend to grow better in a, a liquid media than they would on an agar plate. Um, so, uh, again, that's, that's dependent just on what we know about them and the kinds of conditions. All right. Uh, I thank you very much for your attention.